Hello and welcome to another TLDR US video. As a country that famously escaped Britain's colonial grip, you might be surprised to hear that America has 16 of its own territories. Some like Guam and Puerto Rico you will have heard of, but there's a whole bunch more, like all of the territories that the US only claimed because of bird poop. So in this video we're going to explain all 16 of the US territories, how they became American and what their relationship is like now with the superpower. Before we do though, if you have a real opinion on US states, territories and vexillology, that's the study of flags, then you should have your say in our US flag survey. We're trying to find out which state has the best flag and your votes can help us decide the leaderboard. There's a link to the survey in the description, so be sure to vote and subscribe to the channel to be notified when that video comes out. The US has 16 overseas territories, and in order to understand their relationship to the US, we need to briefly explain their history. Let's start with bird sh**. Yep, that honestly is the best way to start this video. Okay, on pain of being demonetized, I've been told to call it guano. But put very simply, that's what guano is. While some might think that such a compound is only useful to decorate London statues and ruin people's coats, it also serves another more useful purpose, specifically as an agricultural fertilizer and as a way of making gunpowder, two very useful things for a young nation in the 1800s. In fact, it was such a useful compound that the US imported nearly 760,000 tons per year in the 1850s a whopping 560,000 tonnes more than Britain, their previous colonial rulers. As a result of what Wikipedia claims was guanomania in the 1850s, the US signed the Guano Islands Act, which allows US businessmen to claim islands to collect guano from. The wording of the act was as follows. Whenever any citizen of the United States discovers a deposit of guano on any island, rock or key, not within the lawful jurisdiction of any other government and takes peaceful possession thereof, may, at the discretion of the president, be considered as appertaining to the United States. As crazy as this may sound, it's not too dissimilar from how many other countries base their claims on territories. Many of the Antarctic territorial claims, for example, are actually based on the I was here first principle. And if you want to know more about such claims, you'll want to check out the video we released about this on the new TLDR Global channel. Anyway, back to the bird sh I mean guano. As you can imagine, wealthy businessmen very much took advantage of this act. I mean, who wouldn't? After all, it effectively allows farmers to gain more property for free, and have their claims defended by the US military. Not a bad deal at all. All in all, just under a hundred islands were claimed by the US, and this act is where the majority of US overseas territorial claims come from. All of these territories were acquired through the Guano Islands Act and still remain US territories today. And some of these islands are actually disputed to this day as well, such as Navassa Island. And the US still uses the Guano Islands Act to defend their claim on these territories. Anyway, so this is how the US claimed 9 of their 16 territories. Yep, yeah, that's right, the majority of US overseas territory was claimed as the result of bird droppings. Okay, so we've discussed some of the smaller islands, but let's talk about some of the bigger and more populous ones. A good place to start would be Guam and Puerto Rico. Guam was actually claimed first by Spain in 1565, and the territory remained Spanish throughout the following centuries, despite violent uprisings and deadly diseases. The date in the history books for Guam, though, is 1898, when the US acquired the territory. This following the US's first overseas conflict, the Spanish-American War. This conflict began with Cuba and the Philippines fighting their Spanish rulers. The US was still a relatively young nation at this point, but they were keen to prove themselves. They naturally sympathised with the plight of the people of Cuba and the Philippines. After all, they knew what it was like to rise up against a European nation. While the US public may have understood and agreed with the decision to go to war with the Spanish, this sympathy was not quite enough to justify their nation fighting. It took them another event to push them into war, the sinking of the USS Maine. Much like World War I, the US's decision to join the conflict was based on their own ship being sunk. 
Nonetheless, they did join and they won. In winning, they took control of Guam, Puerto Rico and the Philippines. While the former two remain US territories to today, the latter won its independence following the Second World War. So this takes us up to 11 of 16 territories. So let's move on to number 12, Wake Atoll. This was a small island that the US knew about for quite a while, but it was only following the Spanish-American War that the US realized it could serve them a purpose. They realized that they might be using their military, including their navy, abroad in the future, so they decided to claim the island for the purpose of turning it into a refueling station. So on the 17th of January 1899, the US Navy landed on the island, raised the flag and issued a 21-gun salute. A plaque was then installed on the island to make sure that anyone who turned up knew whose it was, and it's still used to this day as a base for refueling military vehicles. Around a similar time in 1900, Samoa was split between Germany and America, following years of complex claims from many Western powers. Importantly, part of Samoa was officially ceded to the US, and it should also be noted that in World War II, many Samoan men fought the Japanese for the Allies, and following the war it became an official US territory, so this briefly explains the 13th territory. On to the 14th, the US Virgin Islands. And they're pretty simple to explain, they were bought from Denmark in 1917 for $25 million. The 15th territory is the Northern Marina Islands. These islands were originally colonised by the Spanish in the 17th century. Spain then sold the islands to Germany following their defeat in the Spanish-American War, when they decided that they didn't want any more islands in the Pacific. In World War I, the Japanese took the islands from Germany, and when World War II came around, the Japanese used the islands to launch attacks. When the tide of war turned, the US managed to capture the islands, and then the UN went on to put the Northern Marina Islands under US protection, and this was the beginning of their relationship with the US. And last, but by no means least, we have the Palmyra Atoll. This very small, uninhabited piece of land became a separate territory in 1959. This was because it was previously part of Hawaii, and as it was not mentioned in the articles that officially made Hawaii a state, it instead became its own new territory. This makes it one of the weirdest territories, as it's both incorporated and unorganised. Ok, so now is probably a good time to explain what both of those words mean. The US territories all have different relationships with the United States. There are, in essence, two main differences. Whether the US Constitution fully applies in the territory, incorporated, or whether the territory has their own government, organised. Of the 16 territories mentioned above, only Palmyra Atoll is incorporated. Which, as CGP Grey pointed out in his video on this topic, is odd. No one lives there, yet it's fully bound to the US Constitution. Nonetheless, that's how it is. All of the other territories are unincorporated, meaning that the full US Constitution does not apply, only certain parts do. Importantly, of the 15 inhabited unincorporated territories, all except American Samoa are granted citizenship rights, as prescribed by the Constitution. American Samoans have an interesting situation, where they're not considered citizens, but instead nationals. Now, you might be wondering what actually differentiates this from citizens, and the answer is very little. They can actually do pretty much all the same things, except vote in US elections, or apply to jobs that are only open to US citizens. They can, however, apply to become a US citizen if they wanted to. Ok, so that's citizenship and incorporated status explained. Now on to the next thing, organised territories. Again, of the five inhabited islands, all except from American Samoa are considered organised. American Samoa, alongside the uninhabited territories, are considered unorganised. We should point out that American Samoa has its own constitution, its own governor who was popularly elected, and its own congress, made up of a house of representatives and a senate. The point is that it has its own government, and although the US Congress hasn't passed what's known as an organic act, recognising it and therefore making it fall into the organised column, it functions far more similarly to the other inhabited territories than to the territories which have no government by virtue of there just being no people around. Anyway, let's have a look at the politics in the five inhabited territories. 
A good way to break these down is again by dividing them into columns. The first is unicameral, and the second is bicameral. Put simply, it's whether the legislature, the place that makes laws, has two chambers or one. American Samoa, the Northern Marina Islands, and Puerto Rico are all bicameral, whereas Guam and the US Virgin Islands are unicameral. However, all five have a governor, who acts like the governor of any of the US's states. In fact, all five of the occupied territories can send delegates to the House of Representatives. However, they can't actually vote. Additionally, while they can vote in the primary elections for the president of the US, they can't actually vote in the election itself. It makes sense then that the more populous of the territories, such as Puerto Rico, has been touted as a contender to actually become a US state. Perhaps this will actually end up happening in the future, and the seemingly contradictory elements of being a territory will be resolved. But until then, as for all of the other territories, this is their relationship with the US. The question is, does this deal seem fair? Okay, well maybe we should just quickly explain how the territories get funding from the US government. For example, during the pandemic, the territories have been given $1,200 for each individual earning less than $75,000, and the expanded employment scheme was also rolled out to the territories. The territories are also defended by the US military, and four out of the five inhabited territories benefit from US citizenship, and citizens of the fifth are considered nationals. On top of that, they also receive substantial amounts of money from the federal government. The question is whether they should become states, or perhaps you think they should go the other way and choose to be fully independent. Or maybe you think the territories already have a pretty good deal with the US and should just stay as they are. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below, as well as what you think about the US still having so many territories. Oh, and we also just released a similar video on Britain's territories, so if you made it at the end of this video, I bet you'd like that one too. It's linked in the description. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that's in the description.